Okay, Galatians for Beginners, this is lesson number three. Title of this lesson, Chronology of the Apostle Paul's Life. Uh, I want to do this because a lot of times we just see snippets of his life here and there. You know, and, we, and somehow when you read the book of Acts, uh, you get the idea that uh, everything happened like in weeks or months. Uh, and when you actually look at a chronology of his life, you find out there are like big gaps between the high points that you read about in the book of Acts. So the letter to the Galatians, um, as we were talking uh, in the last couple of weeks, give a little bit of review on that before we head into the uh, chronology. The letter is an appeal by Paul, <coughs> excuse me, to the churches in the Roman province of Galatia and an appeal to them to resist the movement to abandon the system of salvation that saves a person by faith in Christ, expressed in repentance and baptism, and adopt a different system of salvation, uh, salvation by keeping of the law, expressed in primarily circumcision, rituals, uh, food laws, and so on and so forth. I mentioned that a certain group of individuals in the church, we refer to them, or the Bible refers to them uh, as Judaizers. Uh, they were Jewish Christians who formerly were part of the Pharisees. And they taught that the system of salvation by keeping the law in Jesus' name was a superior way and they were seducing non-Jewish Christians into this idea. And I mentioned before a kind of a short form way of expressing this. They were basically saying to non-Jews like Gentiles, if you want to become a Christian, you first have to become a Jew. Because the Messiah is Jewish and we're Jewish and the gospel came to us and so on and so forth. So if you want to be a Christian, you have to become a Jew in, a, in the sense that you need to be circumcised and you need to keep the food laws and, you know, and so on and so forth. Then you can be baptized and then you can be a Christian. And this is, this is the idea that Paul was you know, uh, teaching against in this particular letter. And he begins, you know, you know, the amazing thing is he, he begins by saying how amazed he is that these Galatians are so quickly moved by this false teaching. And he dismisses it as false and he rebukes the teachers for having spread this type of you know, false notion among the uh, members of the church there. So the Judaizers, they claimed a kind of a special status and they tried to discredit Paul as an apostle. That was one way to get their teaching in. You know, if you discredit the teacher, it's, it's easy to discredit the teachings. So Paul, in his, um, in his response, um, describes his early life and contacts with Peter, Peter the apostle, in order to establish his own credibility and his relationship with Peter and the apostles that these Judaizers accepted and respected. So these Jewish ex-Pharisees, you know, they respected Peter. Yeah, he was like you know, an apostle, famous one, and first one to preach the gospel, so on. Him they respected. Paul, not so much. Not so much. And so this is the reason why Paul talks about his background, to kind of you know, uh, lay before them his credentials as an apostle. So in our outline, we see Paul mentioning three meetings with Peter. These occur over a period of 15 years. That's why I said, you, know, you read it, you think, well, January they met, and then they met in the spring, and then maybe in the fall, but no. Over a period of 15 years, and a lot of things happen in between. So we'll kind of do this in a chronological order. The three meetings he mentions in Galatians. So the first, the first meeting he mentions with, that he had with Peter um, was a meeting that he had with Peter alone to share his conversion experience, Paul's conversion experience, when he returns to Jerusalem for the first time after becoming a Christian. And he describes that meeting in Galatians 1, 10 to 17. We're not going to read that now, I'm just kind of laying it out for you, okay? The second meeting that he had with Peter was during the Jerusalem conference to discuss the question of the circumcision party, the Judaizers, okay? And 
a letter is written by the leaders, by the apostles and the leaders in Jerusalem and sent to the churches saying, you don't have to be circumcised you know, and just carry on as you are and so on and so forth. So Paul talks about that in Galatians chapter 2 verses 1 to 10. That's the second meeting he had not only with Peter but with all the apostles. They call it the Jerusalem Conference. I believe it uh, takes place like you read about it in the, in the book of Acts chapter 15. And then the third meeting occurs in Antioch. Antioch is uh, famous or noted uh, because that's the first place, the first church, first congregation where both Jews and Gentiles were together in the same congregation. That was something new that was in, in Antioch. And so the third meeting occurs in Antioch when Paul actually challenges Peter for his hypocrisy. Because Peter, you know, uh, Peter talked a good game, you know, the Gentiles should come in and of course you know, they don't need to be circumcised, so on and so forth. Peter goes, leaves Jerusalem, goes to Antioch, visits the brethren there and is associating with the Gentiles in the church there and all of a sudden he hears that some of the quote circumcision party people are going to make the trip to Antioch from Jerusalem. And when he finds out that they're heading his way, they're about to visit Antioch, he pulls back from the Gentile brethren because he doesn't want to get into trouble with the group that's coming from Jerusalem. And so Paul describes in Galatians chapter 2 verses 11, 14, how he actually called Peter on his hypocrisy and says to him, you live like a Gentile, you're free. And yet you, know, you, you, you pull back away from the Gentiles when these troublemakers are going to show up. You know? That's hypocrisy, he calls them on it. A lot of people have trouble with that, Pat, well, because you know, in, in this world, in our society, you know, Peter, he's been raised to a, a you know, Saint Peter, the Saint Peter's Basilica in Rome, you know, and so on and so forth. They've almost raised him up to a point where he's a sinless person. But remember, Peter, you know, he's, a, he's a man, he's an ordinary man, he was a fisherman, subject to temptation and failure. Just because the apostles became Jesus' apostles, they received the ability to do miracles and do things like that, doesn't mean that they also received the ability never to sin, you know, never to make mistakes. What they wrote, yes, through the power of the Holy Spirit, but there's nothing in the Bible that says that these apostles went forward after and never made any errors, never sinned, never got mad for nothing, never, you know what I'm saying? So here we get a glimpse in Galatians of a moment where Peter, famous apostle, has a moment of weakness. And another apostle, Paul, calls him on it and it's recorded in Galatians. That's their third meeting. So I, I want to take these three meetings and fit them into the larger picture of Paul's entire life and try to reconstruct the events in order of appearance. Now there's no orderly chronology of Paul's life in the New Testament. Be nice if chapter you know, five in Acts say you know, number one, number two, it just listed it. No, you, you can't find it that. But you have to kind of piece together his life from different scripture references and matching historical data from that period. On the back of your sheets there, you have a little map there with some key places. So you, know, you can kind of follow a little bit you know, the key cities that he visited and preached in and so on and so forth. All right, so let's begin with his birth. Uh, he was uh, born um, in Tarsus. Tarsus is in Cilicia. Um, it says that uh, he was of the tribe of Benjamin. Philippians chapter 3, verse 3. Significant in the sense that uh, there were 12 tribes when the uh, United Kingdom broke into two, the northern tribes, the southern tribes. The southern kingdom had only two tribes, the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin. And so Paul was part of the tribe of Benjamin. Um, it says uh, because, of his, uh, because of their help rather, um, uh, to the Roman army, the citizens of the province of Cilicia were all granted Roman citizens, uh, citizenship. Rather. Uh, this was a uh, right, you know, to be a Roman citizen, this was a right usually purchased by military people or slaves. 
Uh, it carried advantages of movement. It was almost like a passport. If you're a Roman citizen, you could, you could kind of negotiate and go through the Roman Empire from place to place, you know, because you were a Roman citizen. You had special protection under the law. You had special privileges, okay? Um, and so Paul, because he was born in the province of Cilicia, whose citizens all received Roman citizenship as a part of an agreement with the Roman Empire, um, this gave him a tremendous ability to move about in the Roman, uh, in the Roman Empire. Uh, now this occurred, this, this business here of uh, you know, Roman citizenship uh, being given to the people in Cilicia, this occurred about 100 years before Paul was born. This then is how Paul, a Jew, could at the same time claim Roman citizenship merely by mentioning the place of his birth. When he said, I'm, I was born in Tarsus, immediately people said, oh, you're a Roman citizen. Okay? Uh, we know if we put together all of the, the numbers and the dates that Paul was a little younger than Jesus. Okay? Uh, some of his training, uh, he came to Jerusalem at a young age and he was educated and trained by Gamaliel. Gamaliel, Gamaliel sometimes is pronounced uh, that way. Uh, those days the, they didn't have schools, high school, you know, they didn't have that. You, there was a mentorship. Some, some uh, rabbi took you on and trained you. It was the school of rabbis, you know, they would take students. Uh, he was trained by Gamaliel. Um, Gamaliel was the grandson of Rabbi Hillel. Might not mean anything to you if you've studied the book of Acts, you might know something about that. Um, rabbi Hillel, uh, he was the rabbi who held the more lenient view on the issue of marriage and divorce. Uh, at the time of Jesus, there were two schools of thought. One school of thought uh, rab represented by Rabbi Hillel was that you could divorce your wife for any reason. You know, if she burned the toast, you could give her a certificate of divorce and divorce her. Uh, uh, Rabbi Shammai, the school of Shammai, he held a much more strict view of this uh, position and his view was, yes, you could divorce your wife, but only because of fornication, only because of sexual uh, misconduct. So uh, the idea is that uh, Paul was trained by Gamaliel. Gamaliel was uh, the grandson of the great Rabbi Hillel. Hillel was a member of the, um, of the Sanhedrin. Um, uh, excuse me, Gamaliel was a, a, a member of the Sanhedrin, argued in favor of the apostles in Acts 5.33. Uh, he was held in such high honor by the Jews that they conferred on him the title Rabban, which means our teacher, uh, which was a higher title than Rabbi. Rabbi was my teacher. Rabban was our teacher. So he was uh, you know, emeritus, you know, president emeritus, that type of thing. Paul rose in influence himself, having been taught by such a man. Uh, he's the one holding the coats, perhaps in an official capacity, when Stephen is martyred, he's stoned to death. We read about that in Acts 7.54. Saul begins to persecute the church following the death of Stephen. Read about that in Acts chapter 9, 1 and 2. He wanted to return to the area where he came from, in Tarsus, to persecute the church there and bring Christians back to Jerusalem for trial and punishment. So he was a nasty guy. I mean, people were tortured, people were hurt, families were divided, men and women put into prison by Saul. Okay? Perhaps that might explain why he had such fervor as a, as a Christian, because he had opposed the church previously. His conversion, Acts chapter 9, verses, uh, beginning in verse 3, we'll read this part. It says, um, as he, meaning Saul, as he was known at the time, as he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city and it'll be told you what you must do. The men who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. 
and leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple of Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, get up and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias departed and entered the house and after laying his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales and he regained his sight and he got up and was baptized. Note that he heard the voice of Jesus. He was blinded and then he regained his sight. He learned through prophecy what the Lord was calling him uh, to do, and that was to preach to the Gentiles. So there's his calling. Okay? There's his calling. Nevertheless, he was baptized in order to wash away his sins. The point I'm making here is, here's a person who sees the Lord, hears the Lord, blinded by the Lord, miraculously receives his sight, miraculously or through prophecy, receives a calling from the Lord with specific instructions as to what he must do. And yet, what was the first thing he did? He got up and he was baptized. <laughs> so having seen a vision, having heard the Lord, having had this supernatural experience, didn't replace the need to obey the gospel, the simple gospel, repent and be baptized. He had, he had to do this very same thing that all of us had to do. The difference is none of us were called miraculously, but he was, and yet he still had to do what we have to do, okay? Um, some say we you know, focus a little too much on baptism sometime, but in Acts chapter 22, verse 16, look what it says. Ananias says to Saul, now why do you delay? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his, calling on his name. I spoke to a person recently who had uh, a, 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 not a vision, but an epiphany, a deep insight into God. And they were, they were thrilled with the knowledge that they had received. They were excited about the spiritual experience you know, that they had and so on and so forth. You know, and, and that person was sharing that and they were saying, is that a legitimate thing? Sure, it's a legitimate thing. You saw something you, from the word. You, know, you, 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 you came to a greater understanding that God exists. It's like this person said to me, I get it now. I, I get it. You know, God exists. You know, Jesus is his son. You know, I, I heard the words, but I, it's like I've connected the dots. You know, what should I do now? And I said, repent and be baptized, because that person had not yet been baptized. And I've known this person for years and years and years. And I explained to this person, your experience does not eliminate your need to obey the gospel. Same thing with Paul, same thing with you, same thing with this person. Next, his escape from Damascus. Remember, he's on his way to Damascus to persecute the church. And then he's converted, right? And so in 1 Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians rather, it says, in Damascus, the ethnarch under Aretas, the king, was guarding the city of the Damascenes in order to seize me. King Aretas died in 40 AD. He was the one who ruled the region during this time, died in 40 AD. So we know approximately the time that Paul was converted. He was converted roughly in 40, you know, in and around 40 AD, because we know that this king that he mentions here 
um, ruled at that, particular, at that particular time. So he's on his way to Damascus to punish the church. What does he do? He goes into Damascus and now he starts preaching the gospel. He starts debating with them because remember, he knows the scriptures. He's, he's not a newbie. But the missing piece, Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Messiah. That missing piece you know, snapped into place and he got the complete picture. So he, right away he goes out and preaches. And what happens? Well, he nearly gets killed. That's what happens. <laughs> he has to escape. They, let, they put him in a basket and they lower him you know, on the outside of the city wall so that he can escape with his life. So now there's a period uh, when he goes to Arabia. It says, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away to Arabia. In other words, I wasn't converted and took off straight to Jerusalem. I went to Arabia. Arabia is a desert region. Um, he went there to meditate, to pray, to be taught, and also for safety's sake because he was, a, he was a hunted man. And then he returns to Damascus, Galatians 7, 1.17b. It says, and returned once more to Damascus. So he goes to persecute, he's converted, he goes to the city, he starts preaching, he's nearly killed, he escapes, he spends time in the desert, meditating, learning, you know, and so on and so forth. He, where does he go? Well, he goes back home. He goes back home. And he works there. All right, so all of this happens, and then the first meeting with Peter takes place. After all of this has happened, now you get the first meeting with Peter, it says, then three years later, I went up to Jerusalem to become acquainted with Cephas, that's Peter, and stayed with him 15 days. Three years, three years. We know nothing about the three years, just that he was in the desert for three years. Three years after his conversion, however, he spends two weeks in Jerusalem. He met only with Peter and James to share his experience, but not to receive instructions from them. He already had his instructions from, from the Lord. After meeting with Peter, he spends time preaching in the area and debating with the Hellenists. The Hellenists. The Hellenists were Jews who were reared among Greeks in other lands. Or they were Greeks who had been converted to Judaism. It was this same group, the Hellenists, who had debated with Stephen, the deacon, and eventually um, brought him up before the Sanhedrin uh, and had him, uh, had him killed. So the ones that Paul had uh, plotted with before, remember Paul was in with these guys before, <laughs> these Hellenists, to kill Stephen, because he was holding the coats while they were stoning Stephen. So the ones he had plotted with before his conversion, he now debates with them concerning Christ. <laughs> and they were none too happy about it. And so these Hellenists begin to plot to murder Saul in the same way that they plotted to get rid of Stephen. And what happens? Well, they, they, they bring him out of the city. They sneak him out of the city of Jerusalem this time. And he goes to Caesarea near the coast. Probably got that on your map. And then makes his way back to where? Tarsus. Where do you go when you've lost your job and your car falls apart and you got no money? You go home to mom and dad. That's what you do. Nothing new. <laughs> All right. First meeting with Peter. So and then he goes back to Syria, which is in Cilicia. Galatians chapter 1 verse 21. It says, then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia. He preaches there. And he stays there for about 10 years. <laughs> 10 years. He preaches in Tarsus. Then in 2 um, uh, Corinthians chapter 11 we read, and he's talking about himself in 2 Corinthians, again about his background, and he says, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? These people he's talking about are false teachers and troublemakers, you know, this time in Corinth. 
and he's comparing himself to them. You know? So he's saying, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they descendants of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I speak as insane. I more so in far more labors, in far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. The night and a day I have spent uh, in the deep. I have been on frequent journeys and dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. When do you think this happened? The 10 years he was in Tarsus, a decade. We know nothing about. No information except this kind of you know, third person you know, information. This was a, a, period of, um, a period of maturing and preparation for his great work among the Gentiles. He hasn't preached to any Gentiles yet. You ever notice he's converted? He said, I'm going to send you to the Gentiles. So what's the first thing he does? Well, he starts preaching in his hometown. He gets kicked out. He goes to Jerusalem, preaches to the, 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 the Greeks converted to Jew, who converted. To, what happens? To, he gets kicked out of there. He goes back and preaches in his hometown to Jews there. Still hasn't started his, still hasn't started his main ministry. 13 years have gone by, 13 years to prepare. I tell young guys you know, when they want to go into ministry, you know, take your time. It takes time to prepare. Say, well, I have a calling. Good, you have a calling. But you also need a time of preparation. Nowadays, you know, preaching school, college, internships, things like that, that's how we do it. In those days, none of that, there was no structure for that. So God provided Paul's training in these ways. So now, Something happens. It says, so then those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen made their way to Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews, uh, Jews alone. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. The news about them reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem and they sent Barnabas off to Antioch. Then when he arrived and witnessed the grace of God, he rejoiced and began to encourage them all with resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Spirit and of faith and considerable numbers were brought uh, to the Lord. It says, and he left for Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch, and for an entire year they met with the church and taught considerable numbers, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. They were called disciples of Jesus, they were called members of the way, but for the first time, how many years now? 14 years now. 14 years has gone by since Paul's conversion. And more years than that has gone by since Jesus has risen from the dead. A decade and a half has gone by and they haven't called the followers of Jesus Christians yet. <laughs> it took that much time to come up with that, with that name. So the Gentiles receive Christ in the area, in the, in the northern area there, and the apostles say, man, we've got to send an experienced man up there to teach them. There's, it's like a new work that's going on. So they send Barnabas. He's trusted, trustworthy. And what does Barnabas do? He says, I know a guy. I know a guy, not only a good teacher, but a Roman citizen, someone who can relate to these Gentiles. Someone who has experience, been at it now for 13, 14 years. So he goes and he finds Paul and brings Paul to Antioch. And Paul, as I say, used to working with people in the area, understands the culture of that area, and Barnabas serves as Paul's mentor. 
So the next thing that happens is a relief trip for the Jerusalem church. This is a time of persecution. Peter is in hiding. We read about that in Acts chapter 12. The church in Jerusalem needs help, needs finances. They, they, they gather some money together and Paul along with others travel to collect this money to bring it to uh, Jerusalem for the brethren there. Next step, return to Antioch. Paul finds John Mark in Jerusalem and brings John Mark up to uh, Antioch with him. Notice, all this is still happening. Has he begun his mission yet? Nope. <laughs> 10 years in Tarsus, brings him over to Antioch to help with the work there. Another year goes by. After that, whoops, we're going to collect money and we're going to go to Jerusalem on a benevolent mission. I mean, goes on a benevolent mission. Still has not started his ministry yet. Goes back to Antioch after they're all finished. Brings back a young guy, potential. Notice Barnabas is mentoring Paul for a while. Now Paul finds a young guy, starts to, you, you come with me. Starts to mentor this guy. Okay, now finally, 14 plus years later, the first missionary journey, Acts chapter 13. What happens? The Spirit of God through the prophets that were there say, separate, Saul or Paul and Barnabas put, you know, separate them for a special work. And what happens? The elders pray about this. They lay hands on Paul and Barnabas and they send them off to the first missionary journey. And even there, they're not really sent out to preach specifically to Gentiles because they're going to Jewish synagogues to preach to Jews. It still hasn't happened yet. The point I want to make here about this, even though Paul was called in a miraculous way, in a vision, and told, you're going to be the apostle to the, you know, to the Gentiles, even though Paul will you know, do all kinds of great works and you know, risk his life and so on and so forth, you'll notice that in the Bible, he does not leave on his mission until the church sends him on his mission. And the point I want to make here is that God always works through his church. No such thing as a self-appointed elder. No such thing as a self-appointed deacon. No such thing as a self-appointed evangelist. If the Spirit of God works through the church to appoint elders and deacons and evangelists and ministers and so on and so forth, if the Spirit of God does it, then surely we have to do it. And I say that maybe not for this group here, but a lot of times you know, I've seen people, they have a gift, they have an ability, and they decide I'm appointing myself as you know, the evangelist to this place, or I appoint myself as the leader of this group. That's not the way it's done in the Bible. God works through His church. Acts 13. First missionary journey. The church in Galatia uh, churches in Galatia are established. Remember I told you Galatia isn't just a place, it's a province. Several churches are established. You know, the letter to the Galatians, these are the first church. This is almost 14 years after his calling. All right, next thing, got to move a little faster. The second meeting with Peter occurs here. Galatians chapter 2 verses 1 to 10. I don't have time to read all of this here because we're, we're losing time, but it's in Galatians. Uh, chapter 2, uh, 1 to 10, let me just, there we go, 1 to 10. This is the second meeting with Peter. 14 years after his original two-week visit in Jerusalem with Peter, Paul returns again to share, this time, not his conversion story, but the results of his work with the church, including Peter. In other words, he goes back to report on his missionary journey. This was the occasion of the meeting that was talked about in Acts 15, you know, where the apostles send a letter out concerning the Judaizers. Third meeting with Peter. Galatians chapter 2, 11 to 14, I'll read this. It says, but when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For prior to the coming of a certain man from James, those were the Judaizers, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of 
the circumcision. The rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in the presence of all, if you being a Jew live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? So Paul returns to Antioch and at the same time visits with them there and we see that there's this conflict over Peter's hypocrisy concerning the Gentiles and the Judaizers. So that's the third meeting with Peter. After this, second missionary journey and the things that take place during that journey. His conflict with Barnabas over Mark, you know, second time around. First time they bring Mark, Mark kind of, you know, he, he, he leaves them just, just as they're, uh, they're making their way into the mainland. And so Barnabas wants to bring Mark again on the second journey and they have a conflict. You know, him and Barnabas don't agree. And so Barnabas uh, takes John Mark and goes one way. And uh, uh, um, Paul uh, takes um, uh, Silas, thank you very much, uh, takes Silas and they go on the second missionary journey. During this journey, Timothy is recruited. He, he hears the Macedonian call. You know, he wants to go east. He wants to go to Asia you know, because no one's been there, but uh, he can't go for some reason. And he gets a vision and he goes west. And good thing he goes west because, that's he, you know, because the Christian faith was established in the, western, um, in the western hemisphere because of that. The church at Philippi is established. The jailer is converted. Paul visits and establishes a church in Thessalonica and Berea and Athens and Corinth. And then they all come back to Antioch to make a report. The third missionary journey begins after that. Um, uh, this is where he goes back to these churches in Galatia, visits them, church in Ephesus, Miletus, uh, where he gives his farewell address to the elders uh, from Ephesus, uh, goes to uh, Caesarea, uh, and then eventually goes to uh, Jerusalem. I'm going over quickly here uh, because I think we're familiar with this material. And then his imprisonment. Well, he gets in trouble in Jerusalem, right? There's a riot because they think that he's brought a Gentile into the temple area, and so he's arrested uh, by the Romans. The uh, Jews have a plot trying to kill him. Um, and so uh, he's kept in prison, he's sent to Caesarea. He appears before three different kings, Felix, Festus, and Agrippa. Remember Jesus said to him, I'm going to send you to the Gentiles, you're going to appear between leaders, Gentiles, kings, you're going to appear before kings. Felix, Festus, Agrippa, those are the kings. Okay. Then they say, you know what, we'll send you back to Jerusalem for a trial, you want to go there? He doesn't want to go because he knows there's a plot to kill him. He says, no, I, I'm a Roman citizen. I appeal to Caesar and say, oh, fine. You want to go to Caesar to have a trial? You'll go to Caesar. And so they send him to Rome. Uh, let's see, yeah. Uh, he goes to Rome. Eventually he, um, eventually, he goes before Caesar, wins his case. He's released from prison. He has about two years of freedom during 64, 66 AD. And um, he was, in some of his letters, he said, I, I want to go to Spain. He wanted to kind of really you know, reach out. I want to go to Spain. And he said to the Roman brethren, you can help, I'm going to go visit you, strengthen you, and you're going to help me and, and, you know, financially, and you're going to send me to Spain. But then he's arrested, he's in jail. And so when he gets out, he realizes, mm, better nix the Spain trip. I need to go back retrace my steps here to strengthen and encourage the churches, all these small churches that he had established. I need to go back and teach them and encourage them and build them up and so on and so forth. So for two years, that's what he does. He revisits, strengthens many of the congregations. Read about that. Um, uh, Crete, Ephesus, Corinth, Miletus, Troas, those are some of the churches that uh, he, um, he goes uh, to. And then his final imprisonment and death, read about that in 2 Timothy 4, 6, says, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure has come. He writes that in 2 Timothy 4, 6, his last letter to Timothy, his final imprisonment, 
Historians record that the Emperor Nero was responsible you know, for starting the fire, the great fire that destroyed the city of Rome. And what did he do? He blamed Christians for it. We know that because Tacitus, who was a Roman historian, wrote of that time what took place. Interesting thing, Tacitus, the Roman historian, was eventually converted to Christianity. So in order to divert blame from himself, Nero accused Christians of setting the fire to the city because, uh, and of course that was an easy thing to do because people hated Christians because Christians considered Rome a sinful place. It was during the following years of persecution that Paul, a visible Christian leader, was rearrested second time and then eventually beheaded 66 or, 70, uh, 66 or 67 AD. He was beheaded um, in uh, the city of Rome, martyred there. And an interesting thing I mentioned, we know that Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, was destroyed completely in 70 AD by the Roman army. And that's the reason why you don't, you don't read anything about the destruction of the city of Jerusalem in any of Paul's writings. So people say, how do you know it happened before 70, uh, 70 AD? Well, that's how we know, before 70 AD. Because had he lived beyond 70 AD, he would surely have referenced the destruction of the city of Jerusalem. So he died 66 to 67 AD. So what, what did I want to say about all of that? When you read it, it looks like it happened in nine months, but it took a long time. 14 years to prepare him to go on his missionary journeys and then another 12, 13, 14 years to do all the missionary journeys and then another bunch of years in jail. So he had a long, long, uh, long, long career. Okay, next week, We'll get back into the text. Now that we have this kind of little background material, we'll get back into the text into Galatians. All right, thank you for your attention. I appreciate it.